Good evening. I'm going to be short and sweet. I'm Josh McLean. I work in the Wilderness Center for Olympic National Park, and uh, it's standing room only, only at tonight's perspective talk, which is awesome. It's really cool to see so many people out here. Um, these talks are made possible by help from several partners, so I'm going to acknowledge those folks quick. Thanks first to Sarah and the North Olympic Library System for hosting us both here in the building and online, um, bringing this program out to people who couldn't make it tonight. Also, uh, thank you to our park partner, Discovery Northwest, for financial support, and to Friends of Olympic National Park. So I have a couple of events, unfortunately, a cheat sheet that got handed off to me. Friends of Olympic National Park would like you to know that on March 21st, they have a membership meeting at the Visitor Center. On the 23rd of March, there's a visitor sign cleanup at the big visitor center sign on Mount Angeles Road. And finally, April 27th is National Junior Ranger Day. If you have any questions about those events, over in the corner, Ben would love to answer them. Also, they've made concessions available and obviously done a really effective job of advertising tonight's program. So clearly, I'm not alone in being really excited for tonight's talk. Got a lot of interest in rare plants of the Olympics. And um, without any further ado, Patrick Loafman is going to take it away. I changed the name of the talk to Singular Plants. So we, in 60 minutes, we're going to try to find the rarest single plant species if we can. So got a lot of ground to cover. Uh, so do you want to hit the lights some, or is it, can you see good enough? Okay. Oh, it looks weird at this angle. Uh, so the first plant that came to mind when I thought about this talk was this one, which is, wait, you say, wait a second, this is the common dandelion. But this isn't the common dandelion, it's a rare dandelion that uh, looks a lot like the common dandelion. It's called the horn dandelion. It was formerly called the uh, Olympic dandelion. So they found just in a few locales. This little square is where I took that picture. And uh, it's also found in other spots. But the horned dandelion is known from the Olympic Mountains and Cascades and also from uh, Rocky Mountains. And they're now lumped as one species. They were separate before. There was the Olympic dandelion, I think, in the Cascade and Rocky Mountain. Someone decided to lump them. But it's hard to imagine them exchanging genetic material. I mean, does a dandelion fluff pop up off Mount Angeles and fly and land in the right spot in the Cascades and bloom into one? I don't know. Maybe once every thousand years, something. So this was up near the top of Mount Angeles. I was hiking Angeles, mapping and taking a lot of pictures of species. And I decided to go up this side little gully and I got to where it's almost too steep. I was getting ready to fall and it was loose. And then I saw that dandelion. I just kind of laid down and started laughing because I knew what it was right away. It's the rare one because the common dandelion has uh, these bracts will point down or out. If you can see on this picture here. And on the mountain dandelion, they all point out. So if you're really high up in the tops of the rocky peaks, like up in Mount Angeles, and you see some that aren't spreading like that, don't pick it. It's a rare one. <laughs> and this is a close-up of the horned dandelion. They're called the horned dandelion because the tips of those bracts have things that look like fingernails. And it's horny, they call them. They have certain words for them, and I forget what it is, but it looks to me a little bit like a fingernail. But if you actually look on the common dandelion, they can have them too. So, and when I was thinking about this talk, another group of species that came to mind was the drabas. Drabas, the genus of uh, mustards. Mustards are the brassica family. So, a lot of things we plant in the garden are brassicas. And drabas are named that way because I guess someone thought they were drab looking, but when they're in flower, they can actually be really uh, pretty. This is off uh, Deer Park, off early, early season. And to see these in bloom, you kind of have to hike up through the snow because the tops of the mountains melt out first because they bloom really, really early. So this uh, Yellowstone drab is one of the two common ones. There's actually nine species of draba up here. Most of them are uncommon and rare. And Buckingham, I'm going to mention a little later, had uh, draba canna mentioned for here, which isn't, hasn't been collected for all of Washington State, but she's been right on with all the species that are here. So it's probably out here, but hasn't been collected yet. So that's a rare one to look out for. And identifying drab is one reason they might be rare is, is that they're extremely difficult to identify. You actually have to pick up these leaves that are about two millimeters long, look at the hairs on the undersides of them, see if they fork into two branches, three, four, five, if they turn into stars or combs and all this other stuff. So it's a very hard process to ID. So back up a little, I'm working on a floor of the coast range and uh, tonight, I'm just going to zoom in on the uh, Olympic Peninsula. I'm going to try to move fast because we got a lot of species to cover. 
And uh, 1,500 is quite a few, but we won't do them all tonight, but just a few. But uh, what's interesting when I was putting this together is that uh, about 46% of the, all of Washington State floor is found on the Olympic Peninsula. And the land mass of the Olympic Peninsula is only 5% of the total state. So it seems like we have a pretty good diversity here. So the resources I use, I'm going to mention Buckingham a lot. I don't know if I mean, some of you people actually may have known her. She was here a botanist and put together this list of species, really accurate. It's really good if you're writing a floor because he tells in what corner of the peninsula all these things have been found. So it's been a really great resource. And the other is the uh, floor of the Northwest. This is the new version that was updated from the 70s. And so a lot of people, you'll just hear say, Hitchcock says this or that, they're referring to the floor of the Northwest. And this is what my book looks like now after six years. Ago. I went on a, a native plant walk and I brought that out the key and then people said, oh, you know, they got a new Hitchcock. And I said, this is the new Hitchcock. <laughs> And the other resource is this Burke Museum. You can look this up if you're not familiar with this. You can see distributions of the native plants in all of Washington State. And I'm going to be using their maps a lot for tonight. And this is <laughs> where the people often tell they want to thank their crews and where they're getting funding from. Well, this isn't what I'm doing isn't really a project, not funded by anybody. It's just me going out looking at plants and then spending all winter writing a book. Eight, actually, eight, eight winters. But sometimes goat man helps out. Some people think that's just me with goat hair on my on top of my head, but I like to think he's still out there somewhere. <laughs> so how do we what to talk about tonight was the hard thing. How do I narrow all those thousands of species down to a few? And one way would be to say, oh, let's look at the uh, ones that are listed as endangered or threatened. Well, there's 1,100 or so native species. There's still 58 listed that way. So we'll go over a few of those before going on. And we're going to start in the high country and look at just two endangered or threatened or listed species. What you're going to hear about a lot recently is the white bark pine because it just got listed, was that this year? I think it was this, or it was last year, as a threatened. I always forget what it's listed as. So now there's money coming in to do research on that. So this summer I get to go up and look for some white bark pine here in the Olympics, which is good after I do Alcru. And uh, the reason it's listed is not really because it's the rarest species, because there's actually it's quite widespread and collected in a lot of spots, but it's this fungus they call blister rust, which attacked it. It was it was found in what 1920 off Vancouver and spread like wildfire across the whole range. And it hits white bark pines, hits all other pines with five needles per fascicle. So white pines out here also get hit hard. So there's a lot more research going into this. But it's not rare enough for tonight's talk. So I'm going to skip that one. <laughs> and uh, sedges. There's going to be, I tried to limit the number of sedges. Kim says, don't put too many sedge pictures in there. You're going to bore people. Because <laughs> they're not the showiest flower. But there's a lot of sedges. What are there, 84 species of of sedges on the peninsula. That's, and that's one genus, Karen. a lot. And this particular species, the blunt sedge, was only known for three locations for the whole state. And it's only listed as sensitive. Why does the white bark pine get threatened when it's got so many dots and this one doesn't? And not sure why, but there's no obvious rust attacking it. But it is a, a species of concern because it's on the high tops of the mountains. This was on top of uh, Mount Baldy. They have nowhere to go. So if plants are marching up because of warming temperatures, those species on the top are a species of concern and things like this could disappear. But I was hiking up Mount Baldy when I found this one years ago. I had a species list. I had a, what I was supposed to find up there. And I sat down on top of Mount, Mount Baldy to eat lunch. And I was like, where am I going to find a sedge? I looked right to the left of me and there it was, right next to me, looked to the right of me and it was all around me and I looked under me and I'd sat on one. So, oh. so I had to get up and move to a rocky spot to get away and not smush this poor guy. <laughs> but a lot of people don't think of sedges as growing in really dry spots or as high, or in the high country at all. They often think of lakes or ponds or low elevation swamps. But there's a lot of pie that really like dry, rocky peaks. And there's a lot of pie, there's a lot of the diversity. 
So the threat and endangered, I kind of skipped that because I thought that's not the best way. Let's look for the rarest of the rare, things that have only been collected one time only and see how many. And I did a little search on my database I've created from doing this book and found out there was, what, 168 species only collected once. Or it was cited in Buckingham or some other legitimate resource and hasn't, hasn't been collected. So it's less 15% of the native species. It's quite a bit. So we'll restrict tonight's talk just to the ones I've seen and I got good photographs of. That way I don't have to borrow photographs from anyone. And we go back to sedges. Okay, I'm not going to do too many sedges tonight. This is one. The mountain sedge I've seen a lot in, uh, in uh, Mount Rainier. It's actually pretty common in the Cascades, but there's only one, was it, 1900 collection. And this one wasn't listed in Buckingham's floor, which is interesting because she usually has everything. So either she thought it was missing or that maybe it might be extirpated. We don't even know if it's still here. So maybe while I'm up, up, up looking for white bark pine, maybe I'll get lucky and find one of these because I got a good eye for it now that I've seen a lot in the Cascades. Okay, and we'll do a mustard too. It's not all going to be sedges and mustards, but uh, this one I wanted to point out. I mean, it was collected only once, but it's also noted in Buckingham's floor. And I also found this one somewhere on the east side, but I, I'm not always the best collector of notes. I don't always take notes of where I found everything. I think it was on the way up to Marmot Pass, which is on the uh, east side. So it's actually got more than one collection now. So it kind of is not the rarest of the rare. But uh, it's best identified mustards when they've gone to capsules like this. And that's, they do actually have some pretty flowers when these boachera, I don't know actually how you pronounce it, it's bochera or boachera, heard both ways. But there's a lot of these species up there and they're difficult to ID. And this is one of, one of the rare ones. Okay, now we get some prettier flowers, the uh, prairie star. Now this is the bulbiferous prairie star, which is only one siding on the peninsula is up at Deer Park. So if you hike up Deer Park early in the season when there's still snow on the road, you might see a few of these. It, it, they never seem too common. I've only seen two or three at a time. And they're saxifrages. And they, there's another one that looks just about like this one, which is the small flowered prairie star, which is more common. And the main difference is that bulbiferousness, the bulbuls, which are those little red things, they look a little bit like small flower buds, but they will actually turn into small plants and grow without being pollinated. And that one, the rare one has the bulbs and the more common one, which you often see lower elevation bulbs and whatnot, sometimes on beaches, uh, doesn't have that, so. There we go, okay. Watermontia. And some of you might know the bed straws and the, it's the other ones, Siberian spring beauty. Uh, uh, Montias and Claytonias. And a lot of people think those spring beauties and uh, binders lettuce are uh, weeds, but they're not. They're actually all native species. And there's what, 15? Yeah, eight Claytonias and seven Montias. But of all the Montias, you usually only see one Montia. It's the Monte parviflora. If you know anything about plants, you look at Pojar McKinnon, that's the one everybody sees. But there's what, six or seven other species that are really hard to find. And this is one of them. This is a species that was recorded being as present in uh, Buckingham's floor. And recently, David Beak and Susan McDougall got a good uh, photograph of one on the way up uh, Hurricane Ridge. So they emailed me, hey, we got a water montia. So next year I go up there and I photograph it. David Beek and Susan, I just wanted to mention because David Beek wrote the floor of Mount Rainier and he also wrote the floor of Adams, Mount Adams. And uh, Susan's a great photographer and they go out. And since they've retired here and swim, they found a lot of rare species for me. And they email me and say, hey, we got something over here you got to look at. And <laughs> so this is right off Hurricane Ridge Road, this guy. Another rare group of species is the moonworts. These things are related to uh, ferns. They're also sometimes called grape ferns because they have these roundies things that some people think look like grapes, but these things are tiny, maybe only like two or three millimeters uh, diameter. And they open up on the little ridge line there, you can see, and spores come out of those, uh, those open ridges. So the related ferns, they don't produce uh, flowers or seeds, but they just produce these spores. 
This one was the northwestern moonwort, and the whole thing's about this big. So the photo makes it look big. So we went there looking for it with Blaine and him and all this. And, and I mistakenly told them they might have been a little taller because I say because they say they can grow up to a couple decameters. So we and we got to this meadow, we had a GPS right where it was collected. This is on top of Mount Zion, Zion. And we couldn't find it. Walked back and forth in this kind of weedy looking meadow. And then eventually I just people started to give up. And I just stood in one place and looked down for the longest time. And one materialized right at my foot. It's like, how'd that happen? <laughs> And then I looked around and they were everywhere. And by the time we left, there was probably a hundred of two species in that meadow. When I first went, I couldn't see them. And then when, by the time I left, I could see them everywhere. So something happens to your eyes when you see these rare plants. You actually start seeing them. I think your eyes jump over things that they can't identify or aren't familiar. So you go out and you see the same plants over and over and you think that's the only thing that's out here. But you really force yourself to look at a small place. You can find these things that you ordinarily wouldn't see. And this is one of them. Moonwarts also have all these uh, strange mythologies circling around it. And uh, one of them is that if you eat the spores, you become invisible. <laughs> this is really strange. And it makes you wonder, like, is this psychedelic sort or something? But there is no record of that. And uh, it's tied to witchcraft a lot. And partly because the leaflets sometimes look like crescent moons. And uh, they say if you ride a horse to a moonwort meadow, the horse will lose its shoes. And you can use a moonwort to open a padlock. Strange things. I don't know why. That's one of the better things I stumbled upon. This was along the Elwha Trail, almost up at uh, Hayes Ranger Station. What do they call this? Triangle moonwort. And one year in this it's a spot where the river used to come close. Now it's far away and something about a mile and a half or two towards the uh, ranger station. So it's about 15 or so miles up. I found two of these. And then several years in a row after, I kept hiking that trail and I have never found them again. And moonworts are like that too. They are very unpredictable. They don't always necessarily come up. They live as a little gamito fight, all ferns too. But the, the gametophyte lives off fungal mycelia that are in the ground and can survive that way for years. And then when the conditions are right, for whatever reason, it sends up this one little plant and spores and it kind of disappears. Might disappear for a decade, who knows? So they're very unpredictable and they're hard to find. And that's why these things are kind of rare all over. So tonight you'll see a lot of species that it's rare because it's on the north end of the range or the south end of the range, or it's a species more common in the East Cascades. But these moonworts are just kind of rare everywhere. And I'm not sure why, why they are. Now we're going to drop the elevation, look at the rocky balds. Kim always likes taking pictures of me doing this. When you got a little hand lens, you got to get your face right next to the plant to use it. So you got to get your hand right because you don't want to pull the plant. So rocky bulbs are these places in lower elevation, usually in the forest, where the rocks come up to the surface so the trees can't grow. They can be wet, they can be dry. And it's one of the most productive places I've found to find new species for the peninsula has been in these bulbs. This one is another mustard. See, I, I realized when I was putting this together, I got something, I really like mustards, I guess, and sedges, which are two groups most people hate. But this one has really cool capsules. So that's the seed in there and it's fringed around the edge. You can see this at Griff Creek Bald if you hike up at the right time. It's best to get it when it's in capsules. It's in flower, it's kind of hard to ID. And that's really the only spot it's known is, is Griff Creek Balds. Otherwise it's, yeah, mostly East Cascade, just Pierce County collection. It was like one of these old 1900 collections from what used to be a prairie in Tacoma, which isn't there anymore. So East Cascade species frequently will pop up in these dry, rocky bulbs or sandy beaches sometimes. And there's a sedge that also popped up here. I found this two or three years ago. They call it Zika sedge, also called short stem sedge. It's a species usually found on sandy beaches in California. And then it pops up for some reason in San Juans on the coast on sandy shores. And there's an old collection by what Mount Rainier on the west side. And then there's some newer sightings higher up. So originally this was thought to be only growing on beaches and that's it. But they're starting to show up in some of the bulbs and 
even up to subalpine elevations. So this is a species that may get collected more in the future. It's hard to say. Other interesting spot is this uh, right here on the Whidbey Island, which is uh, Goose Rock, which is at uh, Deception Pass on Whidbey Island. That's a hot spot for a lot of dry species. If a lot of times East Cascade species will pop up on that rock or on San Juans or sometimes in Thurston County in the prairie areas. But they can also pop up in the bulbs up here on the north end of the peninsula. And this is one of them. And there's a, another sedge that looks almost identical to this. And that's another reason this may not be reported that much is the Ross's sedge, which has a longer bract here. It's really the main difference you can pick out pretty easy. But clovers. Now, clover is another group a lot of people don't think of. They think of clovers, they just think of the one species that grows in everybody's backyard, and that's it. And they're all weeds, right? But no, there's a lot of native ones and there's a great diversity. What did I have here? 25 on the peninsula, yeah, and 38 statewide. That's a lot of clovers. And, and there's 10 plus, no, there's 10, yeah, 10 natives here on the peninsula. And the natives often are annual, so they look a lot different than a clover. They're really weak, got this long stem, and a lot of times the flowers look sparse too. So I was going through my photos last year for this one and this picture came up and I had it labeled as trifolium species. I, said, well, I didn't identify this one. And I think it's because I, I carried my manuscript out and I didn't have it in there. So I took out the Hitchcock and I keyed it off in the picture and I think, oh, this keys out the notch leaf clovers. And I looked on the Burke webpage and there's only those two collections. And those two collections, one of them is from 1900 up there in King County in a place that's now Seattle by, I think it was Piper, the Piper's Bellflower, like 1880. Hasn't been seen that I know of since. And then on the border is by Wilhelm Schuckstorf, who <laughs> was a, collect, a German collector, and that was like 1910 huh. on the border. And this one's not even, this species not even listed as threatened or endangered for the state. It's like, why is that? <laughs> it's because it's small and hard to see. I don't know. But this was an exciting find. So I saw it on the computer. I keyed it out. I think, well, this looks like the species. And I knew where it was. So I drove out there and I hiked up to it. It's not at the Griff Creek, Creek Bald, but nearby. I found two plants of it. <laughs> and I uh, keyed it out, did some measurements. And I wasn't going to collect the specimen because they're so rare. So I took some of the seeds, spread them around, covered them with some soil, and watered them in. So hopefully next year when I go up there, there'll be more than two. <laughs> we'll see. I don't know. This is a really pretty one, the flax. And I think, I'm actually still not 100% positive idea on this. It's the wild flax that's typically East Cascades. I got to look at the sepals closely for another character to make 100% certain. So I'm going to look at it again this year. But this is, if you go up Hurricane Ridge Road to the uh, tunnels, there's a big overlook right before the tunnels. You walk to the overlook, and look to your right, there's always a little clump of this there, and it's been there for years. So I need to pop out there and look at the sepals and make 100% positive. So I mentioned this to uh, the curator at the Burke Museum, and he said, oh yeah, there's been, there was a sighting on uh, uh, Vancouver Island, and it was right along the roadside, and they believe it was introduced there. So it's a native that was introduced. Does that make it a weed, or is it a native? And this one isn't growing right on the roadside. It's in the bald off the road. I've never found it on the road. I don't know. Did somebody throw some seeds out there? <laughs> but I've worked off trail a lot of times off that point, hiking way down. Because there used to be spotted owls down there. They're not there anymore. And you find strange things blowing out. Look out. I found garbage cans, <laughs> diapers. It's really kind of gross. Then one year I found a gourd. A hard shell gourd. I used to do art on hard shell gourds. I was like, why is there a gourd? <laughs> well, someone's had that gourd, and I imagine they just hurled it. I don't want this anymore. <laughs> but, uh, but you find these weird things off in the woods. So onions are actually relate onions and garlic are related to lilies. Lilies actually got split up into like, I don't know, four or five families. I can't remember exactly which family this is now. So the onions, I often have really showy flowers, and this is a really showy one, this narrow leaf onion. So I found up uh, Lake Cushman Road. So a really good spot if you want to look for some hot plants, 
especially early season. It's at Lake Cushman Road, but those rocky areas coming down to the lake. There's a lot of rare stuff out there. And this was one that popped up to kind of surprise me. Typically more found in Thurston County. That's the, the prairie lands, dry areas, but it's typically East Cascades. So this is kind of a common distribution. You find things East Cascades, a lot of times they'll pop up Thurston County and or San Juan's, sometimes at a Goose Rock. But this one popped up in Mason County, but whatever. <laughs> Real pretty flower. And this, you know, is a good candidate for one of the rare ones because this is one you wouldn't miss. Like a lot of those sedges and mustards, they're so hard to ID. They might really be rare because they're also hard to ID, but this one you won't, you wouldn't mistake it. So the fact that it's only spent seeing one spot makes you think, well, this is kind of rare. So I was talking a bit about the prairies. This is a photo from the, uh, was this the, what do you call it? Glacier Heritage Natural, no, Heritage Preserve. It's only open one day a year. <laughs> and it's on Prairie Appreciation Days. I think it's late April, early May. Huge camas fields and also has this golden uh, paintbrush. It's a really neat one to see. The golden paintbrush used to be on near Port Townsend and it got extirpated. So it's no longer known for the peninsula. Another prairie you can see closer to home is the Kaitai Prairie in Port Townsend. I don't know if a lot of you know that one. A lot smaller than this one. It's actually at a golf course in <laughs> Port Townsend. And they tried to introduce this golden uh, paintbrush to the Kaitai, but it didn't take. And paintbrushes, in part, are root parasites. So they get some of their energy, sometimes from grasses, sometimes from other plants, via the roots. But they also are chlorophytic, so they, they produce their own energy, too. So I've talked to Native Plant Society and they're thinking about trying to introduce this again to the uh, Kai Tai. So maybe you'll get to see that. But a lot of people think of prairies, they think of one thing, that's the camas, which is an obvious one because that was such an important food item here. But there's a lot of other plants that will also live in these dry or wet prairies. And the term prairie covers a lot of ground. It's not just one thing. There's a lot of different types of prairies from very, very wet to dry. But these Thurston County ones are good examples of dry ones. And in those Thurston County prairies, if you look for the small things, you might find these little baby stars, they call them. I'm not sure why they call them baby stars. And uh, this picture I took was in Thurston County where it's collected. But last year I was up uh, doing some spot owl work up the duckle bush, up in the, some of the rocky bogs up there, and I found a good patch of them. And then later that year, this last year, I also found some at Squim, uh, where was that? Salt Creek. So then we went from having no, none of this species known for the peninsula, now there's two, and then I've heard rumors there was a third uh, finding in Squim. It went from being nothing on the peninsula to three, all in one year. So that's how things can sometimes change pretty quick if there are people out looking for this stuff. And again, this is another one that's really hard to ID because it looks just like the leptosiphon by color. This is common, you can find this quite a bit, especially up to Elwha. It's only about this tall though. So I like sedges, I like mustards, I like things that are this tall or smaller. I don't really care for the big things, trees I don't even look at, but <laughs> these little guys, I love these little guys. These, I mean, look at those flowers, they're pretty amazing. To identify these two take a lot of measurements and it's not very easy. So I actually collected some collections to send their burp to come and make sure these were identified right. But but some interesting plants. That's where you need your hand lens to look up close. There are some other species that, uh, like this, what is this, annual agosaurus, that I always often wonder if it's actually still here or not. This might have been collected originally in the Griff Creek Bulbs area, because it's up to Elwha, but it was just said, what, Elwha 1911, and that's all you got to go on. This is an annual species kind of Blooms early, goes to seed quick, so it's kind of hard to find. I photographed this one in Mount Rainier. There's one spot known for it in Mount Rainier. And I always, when it, by the time I get there, it's always gone to seed. So I've got yet to get it in flower yet. But this is one that would be a good one to find to see if it's actually still here. I don't know. And that, when I'm writing this book, I have lots of species like this. They were collected in the 1930s, 1910. And we don't even know if they're still around or not, because uh, there's really no place to deposit frequent sightings. You can use iNaturalist, but iNaturalist does not have a lot of rare plant species on there for the peninsula. I started looking at that, and it, 
you just don't find them. When I do find them listed, they're often misidentified. So, Veronica, the Snow Queen, this was a year or two ago. I found one in Kitsap by uh, the mall area, Silverton. Yeah, just on the roadside. It's a species that is typically further south. So it's really common in Oregon and gets up into the Thurston County uh, prairie areas, but it really doesn't grow in the prairies, it often grows in the woods beside them, actually evergreen forest. And this one that was traditionally collected in the two prairies on the west was at the Forks and the Quileute prairies, which are now airports. <laughs> and I haven't heard if this has been seen since it's been collected or when the last time this has been sighted either. This might be another one that's extirpated and uh, who knows, but that's really close to Bethesda, so they could even be on the uh, northeast side. Who knows? It's actually a real pretty flower and low growing. And where I found them, there was only like two plants. So, and why is it on the roadside? Again, I wonder if it got there on a car wheel. Uh, it wasn't near a prairie, <laughs> but who knows? But that other one species was Veronica, and this is another Veronica that I think is really showy that I had to show. This used to be a uh, Cynthrus. Uh, and this is found in Grays Harbor. There's actually two locales, but they're actually really close together. Those squares, since it's a, th a threatened species, they uh, they don't give you an exact location. But those two squares are actually almost on top of each other. But this is at the Moonlight Dome, which actually sounds really fancy. And if you go to the Moonlight Dome, there's no dome. <laughs> I don't know why it's got that name. I even camped out there once when there's a moonlight moon up and. Still didn't see the dome. <laughs> but last year I went there. I've seen this one for years. It's a really good population. It's right on the roadside in this rocky kind of wet area. Uh, and every year I went, it's, it's been that it's gone to seed. So last year I actually had to hike up there in the snow and I finally found it in flower. And it's really it was quite spectacular. And they call them kitten tails. Somebody thinks that that whole inflorescence it's like a cattail. It looks nothing like a cattail. But it's a bogus name. <laughs> uh, bed straws is another group kind of like clovers or, or this or that that a lot of people don't think much of. There are rare ones. This is one of them, the uh, was it, the boreal bed straw. Most people think the bed straw that's growing in the yard is also a weed, but it isn't. It's native. And how many is there? There's 10 species on the Olympic Peninsula. And eight, only two of them are, are not native. And one of them is the yellow one, which I haven't actually seen, the Gallium verum. I actually haven't seen it on the peninsula. I've seen it in uh, Mount Rainier. Real pretty flower. And that one has the myth or story surrounding it. That, would, that was the Gallium or the bed straw. They, put, they used to put this in beds. And they put it in baby Jesus's manger was this Gallium verum. And when baby Jesus touched it, it turned from a white flower to a yellow flower. And it is a young flower, so that's where that comes from. This is again, this Grace Harbor area. So as soon as you get south of Colonel Bob, this is a really nice hot spot. It's like the, a lot of the flora changes. You get things, even things that aren't rare, pop up that are common. So I always like going down there because you see different stuff. Okay, let's move on to some sandy beaches. That's another spot you can find uncommon to rare stuff. This is Point, Point Williams and Swim. This is a good spot to go. You can hike out. The Sun Cup was one of the exciting ones I've seen. This is related, if you're a plant person, to epilobiums, which are willow herbs, which you see all in your garden. Uh, willow herbs, the uh, certain name, not the name for willow herbs, but they're all in your garden and they're white flowered or pinkish flowered. But these ones are yellow and they look similar to an epilobium. And they're typically, again, an East Cascades thing and popped up on Color Point Beach. And that's out of uh, Fort Townsend, too. That's a really nice spot if you're looking for a short walk, uh, spring, summer. It's a really sandy beach, has a lot of really showy flowers. And this is a really tiny one. But a lot of things, you, you some that you would expect to find in uh, prairies and whatnot. So it's a really good walk. This one also has been collected one other spot, which is called Rat Tail Island, which is pretty near to this one, which is a private place you, that I couldn't get onto. So, and oh yes, the Elemis lanceolitis. I didn't put many grasses in here, but there is a lot of grass species out here, and this is one that, again, David Beek I mentioned earlier. 
emailed me once and said, I got this weird Elemis out here. You want to go look at it? I was like, yeah, sure. So we went out to uh, three, what was it? Crabs, three crabs, yeah. Three crabs beach, there's a patch of this growing there. And I was like, oh, that is strange. Looked at it, looked at it. We've looked through the book and it turned out to be this Lancelatus, which isn't known. It's against East Cascade species. And this is the one that wasn't also mentioned in uh, Buckingham, but there's a good patch of it on the beach. And it's a grass species that doesn't typically grow on sandy beaches. Very confusing. And then the funny thing is I went home and we have this duck pen with a living roof that was made by uh, the owners before us. And on top of the living roof was the same species. <laughs> like what? <laughs> and I asked the people who, who, who made that, I was like, did you see that top with grass? And they said, no, they just threw straw on it. I was like, oh, so they probably got straw from the East Cascades. You may have some of this element seed on there. And now I got it on this roof. <laughs> and it isn't doing too well, but it's, it's surviving. This doesn't have a dot yet, but it's it's actually right there in Tlalem County because I sent a, a sample just to make sure I identified it right because grasses, of course, are typical, typically hard to ID. Bogs, that's not one of Kim's pictures. What's he looking at? Uh, <laughs> bogs are great places to see a lot of strange things. And uh, this was one, actually, Mignon and Steve Acker found a gate, for, had the uh, coordinates there following to find this one. Uh, it's out at Roos's Prairie, which is Ozat area, which is not really a prairie. It's more of a peat, peat land. I, I'm not sure if it's a bog or a fen, but and it's a weird peat area because it's got all these bumps. And it looks like something that should be in Alaska. And uh, this species is one of these species that typically is found up in Alaska or northern Canada. The picture of it in flower is from Canada, and it's known all the way up into Greenland. So this Ozet population is kind of the southernmost one. And there used to be a lot of, there's a, they give the word ice age refugia for all these plants that used to be common here. Just when the ice melted, it looked a lot like Alaska. There were a lot of wetlands, a lot of peatlands, and those have all migrated north with the warming. And so this is one pocket of the species still hanging on. And there's several species like this that are only known from one or two spots. And uh, this is one of them, below. Coptis, it's actually a buttercup family. So I still haven't seen this one in flower or fruit. So I have to go back there at a different time. But they're tiny. This another one, me and Kim went out there. This was during COVID and we, we had the coordinates and we got right on top of them and couldn't see a single one. And the notes said there were like 700 plants here. And the same thing, I just stood there and looked at one spot for the longest time and then there was one. And then we saw hundreds. <laughs> But they're all just these tiny leaves and these things are only this big and this close to the ground. So they're really hard to see. But a real showy one out in the Ozad area is the gentian, the swamp gentian. This is a big, showy, easy to see. So if you want to see some cool plants, you can hike that uh, Cape Alava Trail in summer. You can see this, you can see lots of other stuff. But this is a cool one. Another way I like it, searching for rare plants is by kayak, especially for these bigger lakes and ponds. You can just drift up and put your oar in there and kind of lift up the plants and sit in your seat with your Hitchcock and key these things out. And one of the groups of plants I really like is these yellow flower guys, the bladder warts. What is there, five species out here. And these are fair sized flowers. This one was Originally only collected out at Ozette again. Ozette's a hot spot for lots of stuff. I have recently found it also on Lake Farm. This junky looking <laughs> lake out there. It's got these guys. It's, I don't know why. And the flowers come right out of the water out of nowhere. They're really kind of interesting. They're really these, this big flattened petal. Strange. And they have these bladders on them. So they call it bladder wart because if you pull the underground part of the plant, it will look like this. This is a different species. If you look in there, there's little dots. They actually catch little aquatic insects in these bladders. They can actually, there's opening and they suck them in, digest them. Whoa. So yeah, and this is a, <laughs> one of these predatory plants you don't think of, and most people don't even notice these guys, and they're not that common either. So and it's kind of late summer when these flowers will pop up out of the border. And there's one exotic non-native one that gets all the attention because it's a weed. But it has this really neat modified leaves that float. 
So instead of rising, the flower is rising out of the water, it floats on this kind of like tripod around. And they're really actually kind of cool looking, but there's a lot of weed people that are poisoning it because they don't like it. But it does kind of crowd with the lakes, I guess. But yeah, utricularias, the bladder warts are neat, neat group of plants that a lot of people don't look at. A lot of people don't look at aquatics as much because they're hard to get to. They're often easy to identify the genus and tough to identify the species. And the bladder warts are one of those. They're kind of hard to ID the species. Okay, one more sedge. I sometimes work for the, uh, what do they call them now? Peninsula Environmental Group. Uh, when the wetland biologist here lives, it gets a plant she doesn't know, she bags them up for me, and I actually get paid to identify plants. It's a great little gig. Oh. <laughs> and one, one this, was, you know, this was last summer, she brought this one in. I thought, well, isn't that just a Carex stipata? I think most people would just call this Carex stipata. It's a common species that looks like this, but, and if you know stipata, which I might, <laughs> you squeeze the stem, and it's got this weak stem and the whole thing collapses like Pac-Man. And so the first thing it is, well, I'll squeeze the stem and it didn't collapse. I was like, oh, maybe she does got something different. <laughs> then I ran it through the keys, backwards and forward, and I got into what I think is the dense sedge. Still waiting for the final knot. This isn't squim. Not a prestigious wetland. It's kind of like outside of a pasture land, this little seasonal stream. But it's got quite a few of the species here. I don't, who knows why? I don't know. But to identify it, you need to look at these little seed-like things, called the perigina or perigina. <laughs> and that's what all sedge ID is. Is the perigina this? Is it that? Does it have a beak? Does it have hair? Does it... <laughs> and you answer a thousand questions about this little seed-like thing. So that was one exciting find. That was just this last year. Behind an apartment building, this is up uh, where CJ lives. I forget to wrote that name. There's this behind apartment building, there's this place that looks graded out and it's just seasonal wetland. It kind of floods little. And just two years ago, I found this plant up here, the hedge high sop. I don't know where they get that name. There's two species of the, in that genus. One is found further south. And this one wasn't known for the peninsula until it popped up. I noticed it behind this uh, apartment building. Not at all, again, not at all a uh, pristine low environment. It's a uh, Heavily, uh, it almost looks like it's been graded by a grader. Really strange. And this is another, yeah, it's another East Cascade species popping up for some reason. It's annual. And so in that spot where they're growing, there's actually a whole bunch of them. It's actually a pretty flower, but kind of small. Duckweed is another one I always like to bring up because people think duckweed is this pond scum or an algae, but there's a whole bunch of species. There's six species out here. And quite a few of them have only been collected once. The limna, one on the left, you can actually identify the genus easy if you're really into duckweed. Turn it upside down, put it on your finger, and if it has one root, it's limna. If it has seven plus roots, this is great duckweed, spirodella. If there's no roots, then it's just wolfia. And I haven't yet defined the wolfia genus at all. So I think those two species are actually kind of rare out here. The limna, I've seen in several spots. This is a an example of things that's under collected. The limna species are actually fairly common out here. Oh, but the exciting thing last year is a slow bump on this. Uh, duckweed, they have quote unquote a flower. They have a stamen and a pistil stuck under a little pouch on the leaf. So the leaf opens a little. The last summer I was at a pond, I found a spirodella and I I looked in it and there was a little egg mass. I thought, well, maybe that's a bug egg mass. But then I looked closer and it was in between that flap, just where the stamen was supposed to be. And if I stuck my finger on it, it kind of pulled out. It's a little sticky. I don't know. That was one of the most exciting finds for me. That. <laughs> so I was laying in this bog thinking, oh, this is wonderful. I found a uh, seed of a duckweed. <laughs> oh, another place I wanted to highlight is. Uh, some of these disturbed sites that have native annuals, sometimes a great abundance. This is, you go into the library, I was looking at this before I came in here, there's an old map from, was it, 1890. It shows this Lincoln County Park area is Cook's, what do you call it, Cook's Prairie Natural Park. And I've always wondered why there's these strange natives, and a lot of these are only collected once or two or three times around. So these, and they're all about a centimeter or so tall. So people play golf through here. There's a golf course 
hole on the end of that. And all in here is rare habitat. <laughs> it really looks like a wasteland. It's like, wait a second. And I'm gonna look at a few of these tiny, tiny ones. This is the, uh, again, I've mentioned Montia earlier. And this is a Montia that's about, oh, one and a half centimeters tall, the dwarf Montia. Early, early spring, you go out to that golf course site, and there's hundreds, maybe a thousand of these things, and you won't even see the flowers if, unless you lay on your belly and, and look at these things. And uh, there's just so many, it's amazing. And this is the only place I can find it. Typically, again, it's East Cascade species. And I was looking on that map just earlier in, in, uh, in the, uh, the map here at uh, the library, and there are a lot of <clears throat> big wetlands. And I wonder if a lot of these Montias and other things like that used to be quite widespread in this area and now are reduced to small areas. Another one that pops up there is a euphorb. And most euphorbs, what they call spurges, most of them are uh, not native. This is actually a native spurge. And this one actually isn't too small. It maybe grows this tall. It's actually kind of big. And it grows on the easternmost of the ponds there, on this denuded slope that's covered with that all that duck poop, trash, and weeds. And then there's this native plant that is found nowhere else on the peninsula in that spot. I don't know why it grows there, but it does. And that's another, yeah, East Cascades one. And this is another one where there's two ancient collections and the Puget Trough, like at 1900 sort of time frame. There's another one of those small plants, the mouse tail. That's my fingers. This thing is only, so they think that that looks a little bit more like a tail. It's green tail at the top. It's another buttercup. This one has a few old collections. It's just in Olympic Mountains, 1900. So who knows where they got it? And when they don't know where they got it, a lot of times they just put it in the, in the middle of the peninsula. And it's very likely this might have been collected at that old uh, Cook's Prairie. Who knows? because they're collected by the same person on the same date. So it's really not two different locations. But that's an interesting one and just minuscule. And even more minuscule. <laughs> you get down to the woolly head. Uh, they also call these woolly marbles. Uh, each flower has this woolly scale over it. So it looks like a lot of little woolly marbles. But the whole flower head's like, you know, that big. So this one's been found in a few locations. But I found... Was that last year? I think I found this last year. Slender woolly heads at on a gravel road <laughs> in a parking lot for what's it? The Liar, not the Liar River. What's the one west of our house? I was there with. Yes, I forget the name of it. No, oh, well. but it's right in the parking lot. <laughs> so you pull off into the parking lot, and there's this rare plant growing in the gravel road. And this <laughs> other species, I found a few extra locations, and one of them is on a gravel logging road growing actually in the road. That's how disturbed they can handle. One time I was walking, this is a couple of years ago, I was walking outside my house on Highway 112 and I saw this grass I couldn't ID. It was this one. I thought it was probably a weed. It was growing about two inches from the pavement. So I pulled it to ID later and it turned out to be this love grass, which is native and wasn't known for the peninsula. I was like, oops. <laughs> But it's probably good. I pulled it because you can identify it to genus real easy, but to identify species, you have to take the seed out. And I forget what I was looking at to identify it. So I actually could send that into the Burke to, so they could double check me and they, they agreed with it. So it was good. But this is another one that's right on the highway. So is it an introduced native? Does that now make it a weed? Because it was another East Cascade species. My opinion is that these are probably along the roadsides and other spots since this haven't been seen. But if it travels on the back of like a bear and and other things, maybe in a, a crop of a bird, does that now make it native? Does it really matter if it came here on a car wheel <laughs> or the gut of a, of a bird is a big question. I don't know. But this is related to teff. So if you know teff grains, that's an African version of the same genus. And docks are another thing a lot of people overlook because they think they're all just weeds, but there's natives, half of them are native, and some of them are quite uncommon and they're rare. This one I've only seen in one spot, I know, but then I realized I took a photograph at another spot, but didn't have it labeled where. This is actually the same species. 
And there's one reason there's a lot of mis-ID of a lot of plants is that you can't always go on color, size, shape. You know, look at these little you know, teeples. That's really where the action is. You look at that and you're like, that's not the same thing. So if you take those picture apps, this one, this native species is always mis-ID'd on iNaturalists as being, it's usually one of the weeds and they take a picture and that program says it's the rare native one and it isn't <laughs> usually. Okay, you will finally venture into the woods or most common habitat and it's usually kind of the worst spot to look for rare spots rare species because I think the habitat's so common. But one good rare one is, is an orchid, the phantom orchid. Find this, you need to know a friend of a friend to give you the location because people are cagey about their orchid ID places. Mm -hmm. This is on private land. This guy said, yeah, you can come out and look at it. Uh, the slugs are eating them all. So he puts uh, eggshells around the last remaining one. So by the time I got there, I found the one orchid. It was growing out from under his house. <laughs> And all these eggshells around it, and that was it. He said the slugs ate all the other uh, phantom orchids that year. This is an all white orchid, really a pretty one. Another one is the wood sorrel. We we have the common wood sorrel, which you see everywhere, all white. This one actually has some pink lines, which they usually don't have. And they all have one flower, but there's a rare one that has you know five or six flowers, and they all kind of droop. And this was photographed again at Rainier, not here. This was collected what seems like at the uh, guard station of the hoe, it's my guess. And I don't know if I've looked around there enough when I've been camping up there to uh, look for this one, but it'd be one to be on the outlook for because when was that collection? Yeah, 1921, and who knows? So I've skipped all the endemics to up to this point. Endemics are plants that are only found in the Olympic Peninsula and nowhere else. And so they're rare because of that, just because they're on a larger scale. But I've been looking at what's rare just in the Olympics. So the question could be, is some of these endemics also rare within the range? And we'll do a couple subalpine ones you may not know, just two of them. The sandwort, the Olympic sandwort wasn't described to what, it was 2017, when they were rewriting the uh, Hitchcock, the new version, they realized they had two Species labeled as one, and one of them was this Olympic sandwort that wasn't described before. And it can be only be found growing on basalt rock. That's what it's called basaltica. You can find it a few up toward uh, Mount Angeles, but they're kind of sparse there. And there's a few other spots. There's four others. I, most abundant spot is up toward uh, Mount Tyler, actually. There's a real rocky ridge. <laughs> A basalt rock that comes in there, and there's tons of this stuff. Another mustard is this is my favorite endemic, of course, is the Olympic. Uh, it's probably because it's the last one I found, the Olympic rock crest. Uh, this one is Mount Eleanor. It was found by some native plant people, Joanne and Dave. They're giving a talk on plants of uh, Mount Eleanor in a week. And you can look up on the Native Plant Society and tune into that. They found a lot of neat plants up Mount Eleanor which is down here in the southeast corner. If you ever hike that, it's a really pretty hike too. So this is the last endemic that I had found. And it's one of those things where I had the coordinates. I walked back and forth the longest time. And then even when I found it, I had to make sure and key it out to make sure it was the right mustard. So it was. it's not like you just walk up and, oh, there it is. Sometimes it takes you a half hour, hour to find it, and then longer to actually key it out. Another uh, orchid is the... Uh, the Ozetta core root typically has no spots on its lower lip. The other two varieties have spots, usually. But sometimes those other varieties also don't have spots. And it makes the idea a little bit trickier. And flora of North America doesn't even split these two, and they lump them. So it is a rare variety, and it's only at the variety level, and there is some question whether it's even legitimate division. And there's actually a lot of great debate. There was an orchid society that came here, and there's a lot of debate around this, this variety. And there's also one on iNaturalist you'll find collected everywhere, all the way down to California. But they're really only known far northwest. So I started looking through some of those, and a lot of them I could tell weren't the right variety right off. But others, they're kind of hard to separate. But uh, and I gave up because I got tired of looking at the pictures. But really, they only know from those that area of the Macaw. 
This is another endemic. It's only found in the hump tulips area bogs. That's another really good spot to go looking is this hump tulips area and peat bogs. It's a ridge around peregrinus. If you know the old peregrinus used to be this common species up high. They've split it out now and that those high ones are now glacialis. But this one, yeah, it's only found, I think, four different bogs, all near hump tulips, all pretty close together. And it's only known for the peninsula. So this is a very, very rare one. No, and maybe the rarest of them all, and this is what I'll leave it at for tonight at least, is the quinault lily, also called the Olympic foam lily. It's only known in the quinault. It's uh, montane level. I think it wasn't described till 2001. And there's a small population you can find right along the logging room <laughs> in the ditch. And there's four, and there's actually been more searches, and there's four small populations kind of around that area. Really photogenic, quite tall. And I think it could be a good candidate for the rarest because if someone saw this somewhere else, they would at least take a picture of it and it would show up. So it's really a rare one. But it does look like the pink fall lily, actually quite a bit like it. Usually the pink fall lily is more marble leaf. Usually the quinault isn't. That's variable. Then you can look at some other stuff too. But then it gets more complicated. But usually the pink fall lily doesn't grow in the quinault. So that's a small sampling of 168 species. That was only like 30 something. So there's a lot more that could be the rarest plant out here. And there are 17 that Buckingham mentioned that to my knowledge hasn't been cited in other sources that might be the rarest plant, who knows? And I did a little graph of collections of these 168 species. And what's interesting is usually each year, only about four or five of these rare species are found for the first and only time. In the 30s, there must have been a big collection effort. I knew, this, knew that when I was writing the book. I kept finding these collections in the 1930s. There's another peak in the 90s, and this is Buckingham's work. He published in 1994, the floor of, of the peninsula, listed 31 species that weren't known. Huh. Really good. And I found maybe half or three quarters of those. Still quite a few to find. Then it'll drop back down, and then the revision of the new Hitchcock. They started collecting more. And they find more species. I found eight of these, but most of these were from uh, from the uh, people doing that book revision. So <laughs> there we go. <laughs> I think I made it in just in an hour. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Patrick. We have time for just a few questions. Um, if you are listening at home, you can put your question in the chat. We cannot hear you, uh, but if you type it in the chat, I will read it. Um, and if you have a question here in the audience, just raise your hand and Audra will bring you the microphone. I see one already. We got one. Just want to know can I have you? Hi, I was wondering, has there, oh, been a, has there been a concerted effort to GPS and map the locations for these plants, or at least the endemics? Yeah, the newer sightings almost always have GPS locations. The older ones don't. So all those prior to maybe 1990s and earlier, they're just usually dots on the map. And the really old collections, they just say Olympic Mountains. <laughs> That's it. So you try to relocate them, it's really tough. Uh, <laughs> who's maintaining the mapping for these things. Is it Burke? Burke or? does a lot of this work and they do. And there was a big push recently. I've been doing a lot of photos, just adding them just so it's uh, documented somewhere with a GPS location, like you said, because it's hard to track these things down. And there was a big push with the, the Native Plant Society for the members to start doing that more of that. And you got to have a, a picture that really shows the characters as good enough because it is vetted uh, resource. But yeah, a lot don't have that. A couple things from our viewers at home. Um, Mark wants to let you know that the other day they were in the field collecting um, that Lomatium oh, yes. ridiculi. I was going to mention that, yeah. In the park, it's now confirmed as a new species. Yeah. Good timing for your talk. And then um, I think you covered some early but just to reiterate, is there a recommended plant ID book for the Olympic Peninsula, or what is your favorite plant ID book? Well, my favorite is Hitchcock, and it's not very portable. <laughs> and it's not for a beginner because their, their language is very technical. If you're just beginning, Poe Jarrett McKinnon is a good way to start. And that's at the library. 
and you can also get it in a bookstore. So what do they call it? Plants of Northwest? Park Plants of Morriston in Oregon? Yeah. yeah. But, uh, and Mark, so Mark is a guy who's reworking the whole Lamation genus. I got to go up with him today when he was collecting some of these. The Lamation nudicow, the high country, is now getting split off as a new species, and that's our newest endemic. So he said it's for certain now. Now I got to put that note in the book. Damn it. <laughs> <laughs> He's splitting up the Lamations like crazy. This, Mark has uh, identified tons of new species. This is what he does. He go, And Lamations are known to evolve and speciate really quick. So that's the newest endemic. Now we got a, Lomation, a new Lamation for the park. Oh, it's always been there, but... <laughs> Another question? Okay, you were so comprehensive. Oh, good. <laughs> awesome, thanks so much, Patrick. And thanks everybody out there for coming tonight. Uh, it was awesome to see you all here. And if you have interest in coming to the next one, do make note that uh, Craig Romano the uh, um, local hiking author will not be presenting on the second Tuesday, but on the third, that's March the 19th. So a little change up in date. Thank you very much.